Ready to go? Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to be giving the introduction to the course and um, we'll basically go over uh, why we want to do gene uh, or pathway analysis and what it is and what pathway and network analysis is and, um, and uh, cover some of the basic concepts that we need for the rest of the course. Uh, please interrupt me if you have any questions. So the basic idea for this course is that uh, we um, are, are trying to interpret large gene lists that frequently come from genomics information, uh, genomics experiments, or, and when I say genomics, I basically mean any kind of omics, uh, any kind of experiment that generates a lot of information about molecules in the cell, whether it's uh, transcripts or uh, proteins or metabolites even, um, although generally we're focused on gene-related lists. Uh, a lot of the concepts will apply to anything that has a large amount of information. So the basic I idea of this course is that you've done some large uh, uh, genomics experiment like RNA-seq, and now you've produced, or, or a big genetic screen, you've produced a bunch of information, now what do I do? How do I interpret the information that I have? Um, because there's a lot of it, uh, and um, ideally we like to automate the interpretation and, and speed it up. So um, one of the main ways that we can uh, interpret information coming from these large-scale experiments is to um, basically uh, tell me what's interesting about these genes in terms of pathways, complexes, functions, any kind of information that's known about the gene. So is there a particular pattern that's coming out? Like if I do a gene expression experiment, um, do most of the genes that are differentially expressed relate to the cell cycle? And is that, bio, is that a particular biological pathway, you know, important in my, uh, in my uh, experiment. So um, the general idea, and um, so I'll, I'll use this point. Can everyone see this pointer? Yeah. So, um, so usually uh, um, the genomics experiment, get, you, you generate a, a, a bunch of information about genes, for instance. And generally in this course, we're going to be using gene expression as an example genomics type. But it's not the only one. There are many others, and um, we can relate. Uh, all the concepts that we're talking about are very general and can, are, are applicable to all the other types in general. There's some, um, some specific modifications, um, but we'll just use gene expression as, a, as an example because it's quite popular. So say we collect gene expression exp uh, data. Um, we can take the information and we can rank the genes. So we can say these genes are more expressed than other genes, or we can compare the expression between um, a, a condition of interest and controls, and we can say identify differentially expressed genes, and we can rank genes by those, you know, how differentially they expressed are, are expressed compared to control. If we have a lot of gene expression data, we can I, we can cluster it. Um, we're not going to cover uh, ranking or clustering in this cl in this class, but many people uh, do that on a regular basis. And clustering identifies groups of genes that work together, work similarly, or have similar patterns across multiple conditions, and that also can generate a list. Um, so any kind, any way that you generate a list, um, you can uh, take that list and then ask, are there any pathways that are more, you know, present in this list more than expected. And that's sort of the basic idea of, of pathway analysis. Um, so we, we generally, this whole area has been invented because it saves time to, compared to con the traditional approach. So if you didn't have pathway and network analysis tools um, to help you search gene lists, you'd have to do that yourself. And if you had a thousand genes, you'd have to go through each of those genes one by one and look them all up in the literature and learn about them. And obviously that's time consuming. So um, pathway network analysis has been invented to help you with that. The general idea is that it helps you gain mechanistic insight into genomics data or omics data. Mechanistic insight means s some insight about mechanisms within the cell. So a pathway is a mechanism in general is a mechanism in the cell, but you could have other more specific types of mechanisms. For instance, uh, the, thir the, the last day of the course, we're going to talk more about transcription factor uh, targets and uh, predicting regulators. So you might be able to predict, uh, gain insight into a particular transcription factor or a microRNA that is an important regulator in your system. You can consider that a pathway or just a specific aspect of cellular mechanism. Whatever, however you want to consider it, um, you know, the general idea of pathway network, network analysis is to pull 
information out of genomics experiment of the mechanistic type. Um, you can also, um, and, and in my view, it's this general area of pathway and network analysis is, involves any kind of analysis that incorporates pathway or network information, um, and there are many different types. Um, it's uh, most commonly applied to interpret gene lists, and the most popular type is pathway enrichment analysis, but many others are useful. So we'll be talking about pathway enrichment analysis. Um, I'll give you a short introduction this morning, and then uh, later Quaid is going to talk about um, uh, the uh, enrichment analysis in more detail, going over all the statistics. So just to start, I'm going to give you two examples from our own research. These are examples that are kind of the best examples from our own personal research of where pathway network analysis really helped us understand a genomic system much better than if we didn't have it. So the first example is in the area of autism spectrum disorders. Uh, this is a collaboration with Steve Scherer, who is an autism researcher at the, at the University of Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, which is close by here. Um, so in this uh, project, he's, in general, he's interested in, in studying the um, heritability or inheritance of autism spectrum disorders, ideally identifying genes that potentially cause autism uh, and, uh, or relate to it or, or help identify pathways that are important in, in autism. So this, uh, this disorder is highly heritable. Uh, people know from twin studies that, um, you know, it's at least 50% heritable, um, and uh, although the severity is different, could be different um, between uh, siblings that inherit the, the uh, disorder. Um, there are gene uh, certain genes, are rare genes are known to cause severe types of autism spectrum disorder, and for many years, uh, or in, in recent um, history in this, in this field, people have found that copy number variants, and in particular de novo copy number variants, so those are ones that are, aren't inherited, um, cause, uh, um, explain some aspect of the heritability. Um, and uh, genome-wide association studies that look at SNPs have really not identified much. So what this project entailed was studying copy number variants in autism spectrum disorder, and they had collected uh, about a thousand cases, a thousand controls, and had identified copy number variants using a SNP array. So um, this SNP array identifies uh, the um, sort of uh, uh, amount of each SNP in a in a in a genome across it. Um, so you you have a million SNPs on this array, and each SNP gets measured of how you know whether it's one. Uh, version of the SNP or, or another, um, and uh, also its relative intensity. And you can use that to identify a region of low intensity, which means a deletion, a segment of the genome is deleted, or a region of high intensity, which means a segment of the genome is gained um, in so, by some process. And a standard analysis of looking at this uh, study gene by gene or copy number by copy number identified a few um, uh, genes or copy numbers that are, that are associated with the cases, the autism spectrum disorder cases. Uh, and so we looked at, and this was work done by Daniel Americo, who was in my lab and now works elsewhere in Toronto. Um, we looked at uh, the same data using pathway information, and we found, um, you know, in, in contrast to just a few genes, we found a rich set of pathways that were uh, affected, that seemed to be affected in this, in this uh, disorder. And so the, we'll, we'll learn how to make these maps in this class, but this is an enrichment map. Uh, the circles um, indicate pathways. Um, the size of the circles indicate the number of genes in the pathway, and the, the connections between the circles um, indicate uh, uh, pathway crosstalk. So if two pathways have a lot of genes, they, they share a lot of genes, they'll get a, a strong link. Um, and so pathways that are related get grouped, and you can see, for instance, um, if we zoom in here, one of the a set of pathways, these, these red circles is highly, and so I should have also mentioned that the color of the, of the circles or, or the nodes is proportional to the uh, strength of association with the cases. So the more red it is, the stronger associated it is. So if we zoom in here to one of the um, places with uh, very red nodes, it's uh, pathways that are involved in central nervous system development, and that makes sense given the biology of the disease that affects 
um, it affects the brain. Um, this, this analysis also uh, was a bit more complicated than we typically uh, uh, encounter or, or, or um, uh, a bit more complicated analysis than typical um, because it also in, sort of merged different types of pathway analysis. So in this case, um, a lot of the pathways didn't contain genes that were known uh, to be involved in autism from previous studies. So there was a question, are these new pathways or are they uh, wrong? Um, so we also analyzed, did a pathway analysis on all of the uh, known genes. There's about 150 genes that were previously implicated in autism spectrum disorders. And, um, and those, uh, these triangles here represent um, pathways that are enriched in genes that were associated with intellectual disability and also previously autism. And there were a lot of, uh, um, you know, some of the pathways didn't overlap, but even in this, uh, in this zoom in here in the central nervous system development section, you can see that um, a lot of pathways that are enriched in known autism spectrum disorder genes are also central nervous system development, and they, they share a lot of genes. So even though the same pathways didn't come up, uh, sorry, the, the same genes were not identified uh, uh, frequently in the copy number variant data versus the previous previous type of data, the pathways that they um, that they were part of were very similar. And so that helped validate the pathway analysis. One interesting thing about this study is that the uh, when you looked at in each individual pathway, it wasn't the same gene mutated each time uh, in, in many cases. And, um, and you kind of know that because... Um, kind of expect that because we didn't see any gene, we didn't see very many genes strongly associated with cases. So instead, it was multiple genes within the pathway mutated in different people, in different individuals. So, um, so that illustrates sort of a, a strength of pathway analysis. You can take uh, rare information like or, or sparse information. In this case, you have genes that are infrequently mutated, but when you look at them in terms of a pathway, the pathway is frequently mutated. So uh, we might have 20 genes in the pathway, and there's 20 different individuals that have mutations, and each one has a mutation in a different gene. But And so normally, if you look gene by gene, you just see one mutation, one mutation. You can't really say much about that. However, if you know that they're all part of a pathway, you can say, oh, 20 cases are, are, are mutated at the pathway level. And, and this was all gene deletion. So we had a good... Um, we predicted that they would have an important effect on the pathway and all the genes deleted. So, um, so that illustrates how pathway information can help improve statistical power. So uh, we've basically grouped all of those single counts together into a bigger count. The other way that it helps improve statistical power, which we'll talk about later, is it improves multiple testing correction. Um, uh, um, uh, so basically, you there are we expect that there are fewer pathways than genes uh, or fewer pathways than SNPs for, sure, for certain or mutations. And so working with fewer statistical tests uh, limits the, uh, um, uh, um, it increases the power because we uh, reduce the number of tests and we don't have such a strong, um, uh, um, I can't think of the right word, uh, uh, really blank on, on the right word, but uh, we, we um, uh, don't have to make such a stringent filter given the number of tests to prescribe for tests. Okay, so the second um, uh, example that I'm going to talk to you about is uh, uh, the best example that we've worked with where we've really understood something, something quite interesting from pathway analysis. So this is a collaboration with Michael Taylor, who's a neurosurgeon, again, at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, one of the... Uh, Brain, and he studies pediatric brain tumors. One of the tumor types that he studies is called ependymoma. Ependymoma is a, a tumor of the ependymum, which is the lining of the central nervous system. And uh, it's the third most common tumor in children, uh, brain tumor in children, sorry, still rare, fortunately. Cancer in general is rare in children, fortunately. And um, uh, people had previously known uh, that you could predict something about the tumor based on where it occurred anatomically in the brain. Um, and in particular, if it occurred in the posterior fossa, which is the back of the head and the, the brain stem and the cerebellum, uh, it was counted by pathologists, it was uh, predicted by pathologists to be the most serious type. And people get the most serious uh, 
um, therapy, which is, uh, there's no targeted therapy, no chemotherapy available for this tumor, so it's radiation treatment and, and surgery. And that's quite devastating. We want to limit the amount of uh, that type of surgery would be much better if you could get better, more specific targeted treatments. So Michael has been studying this this uh, this uh, cancer type, and a number of years ago he collected gene expression data for, from uh, about 100 subjects, and in particular focusing on this very serious type that was in the, uh, this posterior fossa type. Um, but what he found is that it's not just one type. It turned out when he clustered the data that there were two types. Uh, type A uh, and type B. And type A had affected the youngest patients and had the, a, a very terrible outcome. And type B affected the oldest patients and had an excellent outcome. So this is very interesting. People would group everybody together and say, very poor outcome expected and you get the worst, the most severe treatment. But actually, about half of the individuals are expected to have an excellent outcome. And they, so it's basically two different diseases that have been previously grouped together as one. So focusing on uh, this disease further, he collected a lot of whole genome sequencing data, and exome sequencing data, and strikingly there were no mutations found, uh, no recurrent mutations. Actually in each individual there were only a few mutations, like two or three, uh, and mo mostly I'm talking about single nucleotide variants in that case. Uh, so that was basically the first time that's ever happened in cancer research. We know that mutations are a hallmark or genome stability is a hallmark of, of, of cancer biology. And here's a cancer that basically doesn't have genome instability. Uh, one of the reasons for that might be it's a pediatric tumor. Pediatric tumors are known to have fewer mutations. T mutations correlate with age. So the older you get, the more mutations you get. And older tumors have more mutations, etc. So that could be part of it. But it doesn't explain uh, that could be part of the reason why we don't see many mutations, but it doesn't explain what's going on here. Um, so Michael, uh, Michael's lab, um, uh, his student Steve Mack, uh, looked at DNA methylation and um, measured DNA methylation genome-wide and found that there were about 2,000 genes that seemed to be silenced uh, by methylation. They had very high levels of methylation in their promoter regions um, in the CBG islands of, of the genes. And doing a standard pathway analysis didn't really identify what's in con what anything interesting, any mechanisms from these 2,000 genes. So um, Scott Zyderdine and my group did a, um, uh, a pathway analysis using a more appropriate statistical test that was a little bit more sensitive and also a bigger database of pathway information that we collect and found um, a very strong signal for uh, these 2,000 genes that they, we predicted are, are targets of a particular complex, a particular protein complex. Complex is PRC2. It's polycomb repressive complex 2. It's involved in methylating histones, or it methylates histones, and then DNA gets methylated, so it seems like it's related to methylation. Um, I, I forgot to say that the methylation also clustered the two groups into A and B, so that was very clearly related to the gene expression results from, from before. Um, in any case, so PRC2, uh, it has subunits. Um, the subunits have been studied individually. These EED and SUS12 um, are uh, subunits of, of PRC2. And so all of the pathways that, that came out uh, really just saying that there's one, uh, they're all related to the, the same thing, the, the, this protein complex. So this plot, I'll just explain briefly. Um, the length of the bar here corresponds to the, to the strength of of enrichment, and it's the negative logarithm of the p-value, which means that it is um, the higher the bar, the more significant it is. And um, so these guys here are very significant and in the group A, and there was nothing significant in group B that came out. So um, when Michael started looking at, into this complex further, he realized that this is a hot topic of drug development. Um, in general, a lot of drug companies are very excited about epigenetic drugs. They're targeting methylases, uh, DNA methylases, and uh, methyltransferases, and, um, and protein methyltransferases. And so drugs have been actually developed for these processes in general. Um, and, um, uh, and so they were able to try a number of these chemical probes and drugs in various models and found that they specifically uh, killed the tumor cells that were coming and models derived from the tumor cells coming from, from patient samples. Um, and then further than that, so that was very interesting. This basically is the first time that a mechanism has been identified in this tumor. Previously, there was just nothing known about it. And, 
any kind of chemotherapy that had been tried had failed. Uh, the only treatment was the you know hundred year old treatment of uh, surgery and you know decades old treatment of radiation that's basically generally applied and not very specific and very damaging. Um, and so here's a, a potential uh, mechanism that can be targeted. And not only that, you know very interestingly. Um, a, uh, a patient was actually able to be treated based on this information. Um, in this case, it was a patient that had reached the end stage of their disease. There was no more treatment options for them. Uh, the tumor metastasized to the lung and it doubled in size, so that's what this picture represents. Um, and uh, so they decided to take a general on-the-market drug that was the closest drug available. It's a drug that targets D generally DNA methyltransferases, and so it, it, it's expected to remove DNA methylation. Um, and one course of this treatment stopped the growth of the tumor, and the child regained their, their energy, and that lasted actually for 15 months, which was quite amazing because there were basically no more treatment options for this for this child. So, um, so now this, uh, this result has led to a development of a clinical trial, which is or a couple of clinical trials which are recruiting patients. So the take-home message here is that um, you know, this, this, this is a really good example of where we were able to take a bunch of different genomics data. So we had information from, our, from uh, at the transcript level, uh, DNA mutation level, and methylation level. And within um, a short amount of time of collecting the DNA methylation data, like a year or, 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 or so, um, we had a mechanism identified, and uh, very fortunate for us, there are all these drugs uh, in, that, that people are using to study those mechanisms. And then even more fortunately for, um, for, for patients, this, uh, one of these drugs that's on the market worked, and now they're, they're studying this further. So, um, so again, illustrating that you can get information about mechanism, and then you, it's sometimes actionable. It doesn't happen frequently, but when it happens, it, it's really great. Okay, so the, in general, the benefits of pathway analysis um, versus analyzing individual genes, transcripts, proteins, SNPs, mu mu mutations, uh, other things um, that you could analyze that come from genomics or omics data, um, it's easier to interpret because it generally works with familiar concepts uh, like pathway names, which if people learn in, in undergraduate biology. Um, it uh, can identify mechanisms that potentially are causal, uh, predicts new roles for genes. Um, it, I mentioned that it can be used to improve statistical power, and it's often more reproducible than looking at, uh, for instance, people who have studied biomarkers and have identified signatures based on gene expression data have found that if they look at the, and this, the earliest results were, uh, from this came in the field of breast cancer, analysis. So people collected uh, gene expression from different breast cancer cohorts, and they found that the signatures that they, that they learned from each cohort were non-overlapping. There were no genes in common. However, if they looked at the pathway level, a lot of those genes were part of the similar pathways. So from that, in that, um, that illustrates how, um, you know, m mapping things to the pathway level can sometimes be more reproducible. Uh, and it also facilitates integration of multiple data types because it provides a skeleton that you can layer on different types of information, and that's something that we'll learn about later as well. Okay, so I talked about any any questions? Or I talked about pathway and network analysis. Often I use the term pathway analysis. I just think it's easier. Um, uh, some people there's different terms terminology used, but pathways are is a concept. Pathway is a concept that biologists know about, and um, you know I don't know if anybody could really specifically define it other than just say it's a process. But um, I consider any kind of mechanistic information to be pathways. But there are different types uh, of ways of representing pathway information, um, and uh, two main types are sort of the typical pathway uh, way of representing data is to have like a stepwise process, and this is what most people learn in, a, in uh, starting in high school biology if you study glycolysis. There are these, you know, enzymes and these steps, and, um, you know, this, trend, you know, conversion goes to that conversion. And so that pathway, pathways typically have this sort of stepwise process. There's also a lot of information that we get from large-scale studies that is not easy to represent in the stepwise process manner. Um, uh, so for instance, people have been spending a lot of time collecting protein interactions or mapping protein interactions at a large scale. And uh, we don't know exactly you know, the steps that are involved in pathways there. So we just represent it as a network of connections. And um, so network information is, is um, 
uh, there's a lot of network information available, and it's very, it, it can be very useful for helping us understand uh, more about the mechanism of um, a particular process that we're studying or a particular uh, condition that we're studying. And so we like to use all of this information together. Um, but just so you know, uh, when we use these terms, this is sort of what we really mean. Okay, so there are many types of pathway analysis, as I mentioned. Um, the sort of standard one that almost everybody uses is pathway enrichment analysis. And usually that means we have a set of, uh, we take a pathway and we just take the genes in the pathway. We forget about how, it's con how the, those genes are connected. So we just represent the, we just take a list of the genes. These are the list of genes in, involved in the cell cycle or in glycolysis. And, um, and we see if that list is overrepresented or, you know, present in our, in our own gene list more than we expect compared to um, how many genes are annotated to that process in the genome. So, um, and I'll, I'll go over this a few times, but, you know, the example is um, I have 100 genes on my list, 50, 50 of them, so 50% of them are cell cycle genes. Um, so that means half of my gene list is cell cycle. When I look in the genome, it might only be 5%. So there's 10 times more cell cycle genes on my list than I expect. Um, so obviously that's that's more enriched. That's the, that's statistically enriched. Um, so that's the general idea of enrichment analysis. There's also uh, ways of um, uh, trying to one one of the uh, benefits of that analysis is very easy to do. Uh, that's why it's the most popular one. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that it only uses information that we know about. So it uh, we, we, you know, we take the genes from a known pathway, like glycolysis. Um, but many genes are not known to be part of pathways. We don't know what their function is. They may be part of big networks that people have collected. And so uh, the second part tries to use this network information and to find regions of the network that are highly connected and uh, also per, you know, uh, uh, differential or change somehow in the condition of interest. So if we're studying gene expression data, we can find a region of the network that's differentially expressed. Or if we're studying mutations, we can find a region of the network that's highly mutated. Um, and that might, in, that might identify a part of the network with genes that we don't know much about. So it's less biased. But on the other hand, then you have to figure out what those modules, what those, uh, those genes do. Uh, at least you know that they're, they may be working together somehow. Um, and then there's a, a sort of more detailed modeling that um, involves uh, sort of a more detailed uh, representation of the data. So we might have um, uh, anything from uh, understanding the relationship of the mutation to the uh, gene expression, to the protein expression, to post protein post-translational modifications. And we incorporate all of that data and we, we, we understand that there's a, you know, a, a mutation. We try to say, does this mutation, for instance, explain the expression, the expression change? Um, and so that's using additional information like exactly how the DNA and, and um, you know, mutations in the DNA is related to expression. Um, and um, these can be used ideally to, um, so um, I, I actually just went through this. So this is, this is from a, a review that we do with cancer, so these are cancer related. But, um, you know, the, this third type is useful if you have a specific mutation, you want to understand, like in a specific individual that you're studying or um, uh, uh, sort of how it relates to the processes that you see that are altered. Um, and uh, this we're not, so let me say that the Today, we're going to focus mostly on this first one. Tomorrow, we'll talk more about uh, part two. And we're not going to really cover uh, the third type. It's, there are tools available, but they're not as frequently used because they, as you go from uh, one to two to three, you generally need more information. Um, like uh, some of these methods require information at multiple levels of, of, of omics. Um, and so, not everybody has that. A lot of people just have RNA-seq data. They don't always need that, but um, it's um, or they may require more detailed pathway information, which we have a lot of. But again, it's not as much as we have in the general network and, and gene set area. Okay. So, um, any questions? Okay. So this is the overview of the pathway analysis workflow that um, we're going to cover mostly uh, today and tomorrow, um, and um, the third day is mostly focusing on transcription factor analysis or regulator analysis. So 
the general idea is that you've collected some kind of genomics data, like gene expression data. Uh, you, we don't cover in this course exactly how you, you uh, collect that data, but if you have questions about anything related to that we're talking about, you can always ask. Um, and uh, once you have that information, you need to normalize it and score it somehow. Uh, so, for instance, with gene expression data, often people compare condition to control and compute differential expression. And depending on the platform and exactly how you're doing things, there might be different ways of doing that. Um, and then that usually generates a gene list. So the gene list could be uh, the list of all of the genes that are differentially expressed, or it might be genes that are um, coming from a cluster, as I mentioned before, if you're clustering. So after you have the gene list, that's where we really want to focus on this course. We want to learn about the underlying cellular me mechanism using pathway network analysis. And there are sort of three main steps. Um, so one is to run a type typical pathway analysis uh, that, are, um, that we'll talk about. And that helps you visualize and identify interesting pathways and networks. So what does interesting mean? It de depends what you're interested in. And so unfortunately, that part can't be automated. So at least um, <laughs> unless you invent a machine that does your homework for you. Um, but uh, the, uh, what, so what a lot of these tools try and do is use signatures of things that we think are interesting like this. And you know, if the pathway is enriched in the, uh, in the gene set, then it's probably relevant for the condition that I'm studying. And whether that's interesting to you might depend on whether it's novel or, uh, or known, right? If it's, oh, you, it might be very enriched and you say, oh, I, everybody knows that, let's skip that one. But then the next one might, might be something interesting and new. Um, so these tools help you visual, identify sort of a list of potentially interesting uh, pathways. And then um, we also have ways of visualizing the results. And also there's an aspect of exploration. You want to explore the results to try and figure out this difference between novel and new, uh, novel and uh, known. Um, so this, you know, to really identify things that are interesting. And once you've found something of interest, then you can drill down to better understand it. Uh, you might overlay your gene expression data on a, so you might identify a pathway that looks interesting and then you can overlay and it just, you know, then you just know that this pathway is potentially interesting. You could overlay your gene expression data on a picture of that, a diagram of that pathway. And you might see more details like, you know, the, reg the you know, positive regulation part of the pathway is, is up and the negative regulation is down or something. So that might give you a little bit more insight. There might be genes that you don't know anything about. And so we can use uh, gene function prediction to identify potential functions. And we'll talk about that tomorrow with Gene Mania in the Gene Mania Lab. Um, and then ideally, once you have a model, then you can, you know, that goes into a, 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 a reporter paper. Okay, so... So here's, that's the overview. Here's a, a more detailed version of things that tries to cover a lot of different, uh, a, uh, a lot of different cases. So um, I'll just go from the, from the top here. Um, so uh, basically just to, to tell you that the, the blue boxes are all related to different types of data and you can see how many different types of omics data there are. The sort of orange boxes represent different ways of scoring and normalizing. Uh, depending on the data type, and then they all point go to a central box that says that produces a gene list. And once you have a gene list, then you you identify interesting pathways or identifying interesting networks, network modules. And um, there's different ways, different approaches to this. And we've added, uh, I've added sort of little yellow boxes that talk about different uh, tools, different software tools, most of which we'll we'll cover in this course, but in this workshop, not all of them, um, that relate to each area. And then at the end, this, these ones relate to mechanistic drill down that I mentioned. Okay, so I'll go through this in more detail. So um, gene lists are not all the same. Uh, they come from different, different types of experiments. Uh, we talk a lot about gene expression in this course, but you can also be doing a protein interaction screen, and the gene list might be a set of proteins that are binding to my protein of interest. Or if you do a, a, a chip, a chromatin IP, uh, you might find regions of DNA that bind to the DNA binding protein of, of interest. And, um, or, you know, you do a similar chip analysis for, micro, for RNA um, 
molecular interactions. Uh, you could be doing a genetic screen uh, or an association study in a cohort of, of, of individuals to identify mutations that are correlated with the phenotype. Um, and each of these things has a different meaning. So um, we, might be ex we might be expecting that our gene list identifies parts of the biological system uh, aspects of the biological system like pathways or complexes. Um, but it also could be a screen that identifies tissue location or cell type. Um, or, you know, for, for some of the genetic screens, we might be identifying regions of the genome and, um, and that doesn't tell us specific, you know, we, we basically will include all the genes in the region, even though we know not all of them are maybe uh, providing signal. So it's important to understand that. Um, and that's, uh, sort of this top box here. So you can see just, um, we put this together because, uh, I put this together because frequently got questions like, okay, you're talking about gene expression data, but I have protein expression data, or I have gene, you know, uh, GWAS data, and um, how does that relate? So these arrows here try to explain a little bit about how you have to, and, and a big confu aspect of confusion is how you kind of convert the raw data to a gene list. Sometimes it's very easy. Uh, and sometimes it requires more steps. So, um, so these, these uh, little yellow boxes try to make that a little bit clearer. Depending on the data type, you can kind of directly go into, like this one, if you're mapping protein interaction networks, you can directly go into network analysis because your, your experiment is generating networks. Um, however, if you are sequencing uh, genomes, you have to identify and filter variants, and then you have to identify significant, significant or recurring variants or score them somehow. And so there's two steps before you can get to a gene list. Um, and, and you have to link those variants to genes, which is sometimes challenging, especially if you're working with non-coding variants. Um, so the, the key point here, uh, which, again, we're not going to cover the details of, but you're welcome to ask questions about it, is that we assume that you are using standard techniques for normalization, background adjustment, quality control, and using statistics that will increase signal and, and reduce noise. Uh, frequently, these are very standard, and increasingly, they are handled by core facilities. Um, it used to be, you know, when when gene express when omics started out, a lot of people were measuring gene expression using um, their own hand built microarrays that they, you know, cDNA microarrays that they built themselves in their lab. Um, and there were tons of issues with that, and you had to basically build the whole system and figure out how to analyze it. These days, usually, you take your sample to a core facility. They, um, they run, they, uh, uh, they collect the genomics data of, of interest uh, for the main types like RNA-seq or whole genome sequencing. And then, uh, frequently, they have the capability to process the data using standard pipelines. And I highly recommend that you take advantage of that. Usually the people at the core facility are working on keeping their pipelines, are on maintaining their pipelines, and um, they identify new software when it comes out and evaluate it and integrate it. They also I know about problems with their machines. So there might be batch effects that happen um, where they got a, a batch from the supplier of a particular reagent, and that batch was acting differently than others. So you won't be able to figure that out if you're doing that yourself and you just did it one time. But if they're doing it 100 times, they can see that there's some shift and they might be able to correct for that. So generally, as, as long as the core facility is able to do all of these things, I, I, I recommend taking advantage of it. Sometimes they charge you extra, but I think it's worth it. Um, and, uh, uh, but it, by, it's definitely possible to do these things yourselves as well. Um, and a lot of the, the methods are standard, so you could see if someone's published, if you take a recent publication that has done some kind of analysis and they describe their methods well, and we used various R packages and we did this workflow, um, or various software tools, you can do that yourself. It is, it's, it's straightforward enough, but usually um, it takes more time um, unless you're going to do it a lot compared to a core facility. Um, okay, so, so that's this, this middle section here. And then, you know, the last section here is really where we're focusing on this course. It's about the biological question. So what do you want to accomplish with your list? So the simple version is we just want to discover pathways that are, you know, uh, uh, or other aspects of gene function that uh, we didn't know about before related to the condition that we're studying. So if we're studying um, a... Uh, you know, a model organism in response to uh, some perturbation uh, or a, a cohort of humans uh, or, or um, animals, and uh, we're interested in um, seeing how 
uh, which, which processes play a role in a particular condition that we're studying, uh, then you know, simply summarizing the pathways that come out of the gene list is a, a great first step. In fact, it's frequently a great first step for most kind of genomics data. But there's a lot of other types of analysis that you can do. So differential analysis is also very common. So what pathways are different between samples? Um, you uh, can also, as I mentioned, find, try to find a controller for a process, like a transcription factor or a microRNA, and we'll talk about that again on day three. Um, you might be able to find new pathways and new pathway members. That's the network analysis uh, part that I mentioned that's going to be a focus of tomorrow. And discover gene function, new gene function. We'll talk about how to predict gene function tomorrow as well. You could correlate the uh, pathways that you have with a phenotype. Um, that might help with candidate gene prioritization. So if you've identified a region of a genome, a, a locus that is associated with a disease and it has 20 or 100 genes in it and you don't know which one is um, you know, relevant, uh, usually you have to go through them and figure out how they might be related to the phenotype. But if you've identified pathways that are enriched across your whole, exper your whole genetic experiment, you might identify um, you know, specific members of the pathways and that will kind of help you prioritize. Um, and finally, you might be able to find a drug. Uh, we did that with the, with the Epidemoma study, and um, there are lots of, uh, there's, there are databases of known drug, drugs and their targets, um, and you can use those databases to hunt, you know, try to identify, given a pathway that you see or genes that you see are interesting, you know, are there any known drugs that target those? And it's generally a simple lookup. Okay, and then, um, okay, so I mentioned this uh, a few times already. Um, I repeat myself sometimes just to emphasize key points. Um, but and the uh, you know so today we're going to focus on pathway enrichment analysis, uh, some, the the summarize and compare part. Uh, tomorrow is more about network analysis, including gene function prediction, and day three is more about regulatory network analysis. Okay, so that's 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 all this part here. This doesn't cover now regulatory network analysis so much, but it's. Um, we'll be focused on in day three. Okay, um, so the next part uh, that I'll cover is uh, just a general, I'll, I'll talk about pathway enrichment analysis to get us set up for the second presentation this morning, and uh, I'll cover basic concepts as well that we, some of you may know about, but we're going to cover them just to make sure that everybody knows about them. And Hopefully you'll learn something new in any case, even if you have already worked with this, this type of data. So again, the pathway enrichment analysis idea is that you have a gene list from your experiment, and that's represented by this blue circle. Um, so this is a Venn diagram that represent, usually is used to represent sets and overlapping sets. So we have um, a list of genes from my experiment and a list of genes from a pathway, in this case, say, neurotransmitter signaling. And they overlap somehow. So there's some number of genes that are in both lists. Now, how do I know if the, uh, the, this overlap is significant or it's just expected by chance? If I have really big lists, I'm definitely going to get some overlap by chance. Um, if the, or, or even if one of the lists is really big, I'm going to, you know, the bigger these, the bigger any or both of these circles are, the more, you know, the more genes they have, the more likely it is that I'll get overlap, right? So there are a number of statistical tests that measure this, um, you know, the sort of standard ones are Fisher's exact test uh, related to chi-square test, and Quaid is going to go over this in, in more detail. Um, and then, um, uh, but there, there are actually a, a range of statistical tests for this type of analysis. Um, I should also, um, and so without going into too many details, I'll just mention this as a general idea. Um, okay, so the, what we need to do this enrichment is we need a list of pathways so that's you know these circles. So we need this is looking at my gene overlapping, my gene list overlapping with one pathway. But if you have a thousand pathways, you do this a thousand times, and you need a database of pathways. So we need to get that information from somewhere. And it also um, it also requires that you know that you've used um, that you've treated this list in a particular standard way. So in particular, you have to use gene names or gene identifiers that are you know, other people use because you can't get overlap if you can't if you can't even match up what you're talking about. So if one person uses, you know, gene name A and another person uses a different name for that gene, you're not going to get a match, 
right? So you do you need to understand something about how people name genes and how people represent genes in databases. So that's what I'm going to cover uh, first. Um, so I, I'm basically going to cover these two blue boxes in the intro, and then after the break, we'll do you know actual learning about the concept of how you discover enriched pathways and the statistics behind it. Okay, so gene and protein identifiers. Uh, um, this is something that many people know, but you may not know all the, all the details. Um, an identifier is ideally a unique, stable name or number that helps keep track of database records. So you could imagine your your social insurance, you know, your driver's license number. Um, also, you know, uh, a typical gene identifier is an entree gene ID. So entree is uh, the gene database maintained by the U.S. NCBI. The NCBI is the National Center for Biotechnology Information. That's part of the National Library of Medicine that runs PubMed, so everybody knows about that. Um, and they maintain lots of different databases, um, so many that, you know, actually uh, it's probably over 100. And each one of those databases has an o their own identifier, their own type of identifier. So that means that there, there are lots of different um, types of identifiers for, different, for, for, the, for a gene. I mean, it's not only that. Genes are represented, um, when we say genes, we often mean, you know, the DNA region, the RNA transcript that's expressed from that region, different versions of that RNA transcript that's expressed from that region, different versions of the gene that has different start sites, um, and all of all the proteins. You could imagine each protein is that's post-translationally modified somehow, that's cut up or chemically modified as a different molecule. So you could keep track of each one of those, and each one gets its own identifier, and so that creates a complicated array of potential identifiers for these things in different databases. Um, so it's important to just understand that there are multiple identifiers for a gene and that there's a type of molecule usually associated with that. So if you're working with entree gene, it's really talking about genes. You can't find the sequence in the gene database. It just tells you this is a gene. There's not one necessarily one sequence. It's an information concept. Um, when you go to the transcript database, then it has the actual sequence in the protein database. Um, okay, uh, there are a lot of identifiers. Um, just for your information, these are some examples. So you can look through those and see, you, you can sort of see how people represent these things. And you might, usually you, once you see enough of these, you start recognizing them. Um, but sometimes you can't really distinguish them. Like for instance, some database, a number of databases just use numbers. And then you know integers, like uh, or whole numbers, and those you know you you won't be able to distinguish. Like if someone gives you a list of numbers and another list of numbers, you won't know what database it's from necessarily. However, usually um, uh, the the ones highlighted in red are ones that we kind of recommend. So entree gene is a really good one because it's fairly stable uh, and unique, and it focuses on the gene um, and um, um, I'll talk. I'll talk about reference uh, recommendations in a sec. But the the ones that are highlighted in red kind of recommend thinking about. Um, okay, so there's a lot of identifiers, um, and it uh, it's it's also important to recognize that some software tools only recognize certain types of identifiers. As time goes on, this gets. This gets better. It used to be really a big problem a long time ago, especially when people were working with affymetrics arrays, because each version of the array came out with its own identifiers, and you had to map them, and it's very complicated. And now with RNA seq, it's easier. Um, and uh, but it, you sometimes see issues with um, identifiers that are linked to the genomics technology itself. Um, so, um, and th this goes over, you know four main uses of identifiers. I won't really go through them. Um, I guess one important one is, I, I kind of explained why it's important already, but you can, you can think about these. Um, so fortunately, there are identifier mapping services if needed. So if you have, um, uh, if you, and, and often these are integrated with the tools themselves. So if you, for, for pathway enrichment. So if you have a, uh, a list of identifiers that is not the default one recognized by the tool, you can convert it to the one that is. Um, you do have to be aware of ambiguous identifier mappings. Um, so in this case, this G-Profiler tool, which we'll cover uh, in this workshop, um, alerts you to say, you know, one of the identifiers that you put in your, your gene list has, could mean two different genes. So which one do you mean? Um, okay, so, oops. Um, so, um, right, okay, so the, uh, 
Um, so there are some challenges relating to this. Uh, and just to emphasize the point, yes? So, sorry. Um, you, you recommend the points on the writing frameworks, but uh, do you have, uh, is there any specific disadvantage to UCSC? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. So the UCSC identity frameworks, so against that, beyond some level, you think it's better? And so what is this specific should not be used? I'm not saying here that you shouldn't use a particular identifier type. If it's convenient for you, that's good. It's just that these ones are ones that are most frequently rec rec recognized by pathway analysis tools. That's the main reason why they're recommended here. But they could other identifiers. Like this before, too, right? So for some reason, people prefer on some is it because there are and there are no duplicates. Um, the ensemble keeps track of their identifiers care very carefully, um, but uh, this is not meant to be a comprehensive. It just it, for for certain reasons, a lot of pathway analysis tools um, have r used ensemble identifiers, and the main actually the, the real reason is that ensemble provides a really nice. Um, they, they could easily be built on UCSC or in something else, but um, ensemble provides a lot of uh, nice. APIs that are like systems that allow people to build software on, and so people have taken advantage of those, and then they happen to use the the ensemble. So, so as a user, probably if we consistently use ensemble identifiers, and probably will have more access to software packages, or will be more compatible. Yeah, I mean, actually, Entree Gene, I think, is the, the the biggest one. That's why this is bolded here, and so I'll get into recommendations in a sec. Um, so. Uh, the um, yeah, so so there are some some challenges uh, to mapping identifiers. Um, so uh, one of the one of the main challenges is that you have uh, you know is, that I mentioned is that um, if you don't have if you make a mistake with identifier map matching, you could make a, um, a few different types of mistakes when you're comparing your data to pathways. So one you could just miss miss a gene. So if I have an uh, an identifier that's not present, that I'm using a different identifier that's not recognized, I won't match to the pathway. So that's obvious. Um, worse is if you match the wrong pathway. And that means that you're actually going to make a mistake. Uh, you might get the wrong information coming out. Um, and so um, it, in general, it's it, the gene name itself is like often the gene name that's used colloquially in the literature is often not a good identifier because it's not hasn't been standardized. The gene symbol, and I use the difference between symbol and name. Symbol is uh, usually um, is usually standardized by a community group. Like for human, the human genome, there's a human genome naming commission for model organism. For model organisms, it's the model organism databases, and they usually say, okay, this is the symbol that we're all going to use if we're going to use the, the official symbol for the gene. Um, but even then, it's like when you have names, it's sometimes difficult. So um, one one case is that that people many people may be familiar with is that if you use Excel, which is very commonly used as a spreadsheet to manage gene lists, Excel uh, converts automatically converts certain gene names. It recognizes them as dates or other things. How many people have seen this? Yeah. So most of the most of the class are familiar with this. Um, you know, OCT4 is an important transcription factor, um, stem cell biology, and Excel. We'll, now, we'll, we'll just convert it to October 4th. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is really, really quite uh, um, insidious. So the, um, a, and people have written papers about this. Uh, so in general, um, another challenge is that you might not reach 100% coverage. So you might have 100 genes in your list and only 95 of them can be mapped. Um, sometimes there might be good reasons for that, like the gene in your list that comes from a genomics experiment and is based on an annotation uh, that you used at one particular moment in time. Um, the genome annotation changes over time, so you might have you might have a gene in your list that's no longer considered a gene. It's being moved to pseudogene status or something like that. And some it's like a good hundred genes in the human genome that every time we check, they're like flipping back and forth between gene and pseudogene, and sometimes they're just erased, you know, completely when people realize that they're probably not really genes. So, um, so it's not it may, because of that. It, you may not really expect to be able to always have hundred percent coverage, and it get the, it gets worse if you're working with older data compared to current genome annotation. 
Um, so people have, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, so just with the Excel thing, there's a couple of papers. There's a paper in 2004 that talked about how bad the problems are ex with Excel. They found that a lot of databases have started to internalize names like October 4th for OCT4 as a synonym because people kept on loading data that had October 4th is mapped to an entree gene ID. Um, and then even, you know, just, la just you know, in the past eight months, I think there was a, it was just the end of 2016, a paper came out, gene name errors are widespread in the scientific literature, and it basically said, don't use Excel. <laughs> just don't use it. Although there are ways of using Excel to, um, it, you, can't, you can't turn off that feature. Um, so you can, you have to remember to paste your gene list as text. Because if it pastes as general, or uh, then it will it will automatically try to recognize the type, and one of the types is date, and so then it, that's what the problem comes in. Anyway, just just one one little story of warning that's kind of interesting. Um, here's a paper that was published um, quite a while ago in Nature that was retracted later because they made a mistake with their gene identifiers. So they they um, there's two gene genes that were called HES1, and they made a whole paper about HES1, and then people afterwards, as soon as it was published, said that's not the HES1 that you're, you really mean. Um, and it was actually that they made a mistake in the database search and they had to retract the paper, unfortunately. So um, it does get to that stage. Uh, okay, so um, these recommendations are for genes and, and proteins. Uh, in general, most of the pathway analysis methods that are out there, in fact, most bioinformatics methods don't really consider splice forms. Um, splicing is obviously important and it can be considered and it's uh, you know we, we have increasing information about it but in general we don't have a lot of information about splice forms still uh, we don't know what you know how to distinguish the function of one splice form versus another um, frequently and so mostly all splice forms get lumped together with a gene when you look up uh, a pathway so the Wnt pathway will have a gene in it and one of the splice forms from that gene might might not be involved in the wind pathway, but it will still be lumped together. And so that's a limitation of the resolution of where we are in biology today. Um, not exactly because you could really study the splice forms if you want, but um, most most um, uh, a lot of technologies don't give you a lot of genomics technologies don't give you a lot of very comprehensive and accurate information at that level. So again, this this um, course focuses on genes uh, for that reason. Um, okay, so the main recommendation is to map everything to entree gene IDs or official gene symbols using a spreadsheet software, preferably not Excel, um, but most people will use Excel anyway. You can use it and just be careful. Um, if, you're if, if you really want to have 100% coverage, you can, you can um, uh, and, and you can't do a mapping, um, you can't map one identifier to another, you can just manually look it up and see if you can figure out why it's not there and you can curate it. Um, and then, um, you know, the recommendation of this last paper in 2016 was to use an open source uh, spreadsheet system like Google Spreadsheets on, on the web um, or open office, which don't have this date conversion issue. Okay, so uh, just to summarize, um, genes and their products can have many different types of identifiers. Genomics can sometimes require the conversion of one identifier to another. Um, ID mapping services are available increasingly as part of pathway analysis tools. Um, and the, if you use standard identifiers like gene symbols and entree gene IDs, it will reduce headaches for identifier mapping. But it won't eliminate them all because of some of the issues that I mentioned. Um, any, any more questions about that? Okay. Okay, so the next part is thinking about pathways and trying to uh, learn a little bit about where pathway information comes from. Okay, so pathway, um, pa uh, you, you know, pathway information uh, basically mostly comes from databases. Um, there are other types of attributes for genes that you can use in pathway enrichment analysis, uh, like, um, and some of these are really not pathways, and so you'll notice that some of the pathway enrichment analysis are, are called gene set enrichment analyses tools. And the reason for that is that they, they will work with any gene set. It doesn't have to be a pathway gene set. It could be a chromosome uh, position genes, gene set, or it could be a, a set of genes that are associated with the disease, or it could be a set of genes that are the target of a uh, drug. Um, so, um, but 
the reason why, again, I focus on pathways is because I find that that's typically the first thing that everybody wants to do when you have the omics experiment is learn about pathways, and those other things are often um, uh, more detail-oriented things that you can do afterwards. Okay, so focusing on pathways, um, what, uh, pathway information comes from databases, and a lot of it, uh, uh, and, and a lot of these databases like Reaction, which we'll learn about tomorrow, stores a lot of detailed information about pathways. All the biochemistry of the pathways is, uh, you know, specified in a high level of detail. Um, but remember that when we convert for the standard pathway analysis, when we, con when we use that pathway information, we forget about all the details and we just say, what genes are part of what pathway? And there's a really good source of information that stores pathways at that level, and it's gene ontology. Um, how many people know about the gene ontology or have used it? Okay, so quite a few. Um, so I'll just go over this quickly, just so everyone's on the same page. Gene ontology uh, sort of has two parts. One part is a set of biological phrases or terms uh, that describe gene function, and they're applied to genes. So you can have the word protein kinase. A gene could be a protein kinase. Apoptosis. The gene could be part of the apoptosis process. Uh, membrane. The gene can be part of a membrane or localized in a membrane. It also is a dictionary because it, each of these terms has a definition, so it's actually quite useful as a dictionary for biology. Um, and it's also an ontology. An, an ontology is a formal system for describing knowledge. Um, you know, the first versions of this were like date back to ancient Greeks with Aristotle trying to categorize the world as like earth, air, wind, and fire. You know, that's like the first ontology. Um, so wasn't you know, the, the gene ontology is a lot more scientifically uh, oriented and a lot more detailed. So here's an example. Um, uh, the, um, here's an example of an ontology. So all of these, each box here represents a term, and the terms are related to each other. Um, and in general, the, the terms at the bottom of the, at the top of the hierarchy are very general terms, and the ones at the bottom of the hierarchy are specific terms. So here's a term at the bottom, um, B cell apoptosis, and then it's a type of, um, you know, cell death. It's a type of homeostasis, um, and so you get different different branches up, and then right at the top, it's a type of biological process. So biological process is just so general, everything underneath is a type of biological process. So within the terms, these within the hierarchy, these these lines indicate um, different types of relationships, like apoptosis is part of, um, you know, this other process, or it's a type of this type of process. So um, it describes gene function in multiple levels of detail, and terms can have more than one parent. And usually when a gene is annotated to one of these terms, it automatically means that all of the terms above it are also, you know, they're automatically annotated to that. So what that means is that gene ontology often... Um, often uh, creates a, associates a lot of terms to a gene, and sometimes that causes issues because you have to figure out how to deal with all of these terms. Um, so this course will definitely teach you about how to, one way of dealing with that. Um, okay, so gene ontology covers three major aspects of biology, where things are in the cell, the enzymatic function or you know, chemical function of a, of, a, of, a pro, of a gene, and the biological process, uh, which is basically pathways. So usually when we do pathway analysis, we focus on biological process. Um, I find that that's, it's, it's better to just focus on biological process in the beginning because if you include molecular function inside of their component, you include a lot more information and it doesn't give you a lot of, it doesn't give you as much insight as the biological process part. So when I see the results of a pathway enrichment analysis and it has a whole bunch of cell locations, that's not going to tell me as much about biological processes like pathways, like apoptosis and wind signaling pathway and other things like that. So instead of just including those other things and having them come up and make, like, add a bunch of extra noise and information you have to deal with, just start with biological process as the pathway. So again, that's a general comment that I have, general recommendation that I have with pathway analysis is that make sure the set of things that you're studying, that you're analyzing in your database of gene sets are pathways, at least to start with. The other things you can add on later will just help it helps with interpretation. Okay, so there are two parts of gene ontology. There are the go terms that I explained, and these are added by uh, people who work in the gene ontology project. Um, you can request new terms. Uh, they add new terms over time. I noticed 
between last year and this year that they added very few terms, even though over time before that they were growing rapidly. So I think they're kind of reaching a uh, like a, a little bit more stable point because they have tens of thousands of terms. They have like 40, almost 45,000 terms in genotology, um, and, um, uh, and which is a lot. Um, and then the second part is annotations, and this is which is this is the part that's still very incomplete. When you take one of the terms from the dictionary and you put it on a gene, like gene, you know, uh, gene A is part of the cell cycle. There is that's called an annotation, and when you do that, there's additional information that you that the curator adds, including the evidence of why they why they made that link. Um, and oops. Um, so uh, um, a key point is that there are, um, so I'll, I'll talk about the evidence, and um, a key point is that some of these annotations are created, uh, a lot of the annotations are created by, with, with human, you know, by, by people and, or people reviewing electronic systems, um, and some of them are created uh, automatically without any human review. Okay, so I mentioned hierarchical annotation. So a gene can be part of multiple multiple uh, terms, and even if it's part of one term, it automatically gets all of the parent terms. Um, so that can create, uh, as I said, many terms for for a gene. Um, and uh, and I, and I also mentioned that um, this annotation is sort of the, there's kind of two types. There's curated by scientists, which are expected to be higher quality, but unfortunately they're smaller in number because it's time consuming to, to do that. Um, and this reviewed computational analysis, uh, which at least somebody's looking at the computer program. And then some of the, and then quite a lot of annotation is electronically uh, annotated without human review. And these are typically thought to be low quality compared to the manual ones. Now it's not always exactly true. Sometimes computational, automatic computational prediction methods can be extremely accurate. Um, so an example is uh, membrane, transmembrane domain prediction. So if you predict, uh, if you have a protein sequence and you want to predict if there's a transmembrane domain and thus it's going to be expressed in the membrane somewhere, that's extremely accurate. Um, but others are, are very, you know, very inaccurate. So a key point is to be aware of annotation origin. And how do you do that? Um, fortunately, gene ontology has made a bunch of evidence types, um, and they're all coded. So we won't go through these in detail, but all of the ones at the top are, um, you know, uh, these are experiment. These are ex um, codes that indicate that there's experimental evidence. These are codes that indicate computational analysis, reviewed computational analysis, and these are codes that basically indicate somebody read a paper and typed the information from the paper. And then IEA is all the other ones that are not human re reviewed. So um, often you'll see you know, exclude a button to exclude IEA from a pathway analysis um, tool. And I actually recommend that you do that in the beginning um, because you want to focus on pathways that we have higher confidence in. The only example of where I don't recommend that you do that is if you are working with an organism that hasn't had a lot of curation. And so, and, and some, some, you know, some model organisms are curated better than others, as I'll just talk about in a second. Um, but also, if you're not working with a model organism, then you usually are using data that's all inferred from electronic annotation. And then you have to work with that information. Um, and sometimes, as I said, it can be good, but you just have to be aware of where it comes from. Okay, so I, I alluded, I briefly alluded to the um, uh, point that um, annotation is dependent on, on a number of factors, uh, including species. So some organisms are better annotated. Some genomes, uh, organism, organism, organismal genomes, are better annotated than others. Um, so uh, gene ontology is applicable to any organism. Um, all major euka eukaryotic model organism species and, and some bacterial and parasite species uh, have ha curated annotation. Uh, and um, uh, the, f the full list is on the genotol available on the Gene Ontology website. Um, but it's important to recognize that there's variable coverage. So depending on the organism that you're working on, you can have better or worse coverage of gene ontology. Um, and also you can have better or worse coverage of the experimental or, um, you know, fewer or greater 
genes could be only covered by the IEA, the inferred from electronic annotation. So you might have, you know, different varying coverage of like the better, higher confident annotations or the less confident annotations. Um, this is just an example to show you for different model organisms what the variability is. So you can see some of them um, have very few experimental evidence sources. Just to mention that a lot of databases contribute to this, um, and there are people that, you know, depending on the community that you're in, you can actually communicate with and get things changed in gene ontology if you want. Um, okay, so just a couple of additional concepts with gene ontology uh, that you might come across. Uh, one is the idea of a slim version of gene ontology. So gene ontology has tens of thousands of terms. Sometimes people want to summarize the information and they don't want to use all those tens of thousands of terms to summarize their data. Like for instance, you're making a pie chart and you just want to say, you know, what fraction of my proteins are in the membrane versus the cytoplasm. If you use the cellular component part of gene ontology, you have 10,000 names for different parts of the cell. Well, you're not going to make a pie chart with 10,000 slices. So, um, you know, how do you reduce that to a simpler set? So this Go Slim offers an official reduced set of Go terms that has, you know, a much more manageable number for things where you need to, for tasks where you need to do some quick summarization without dealing with all of the, the, the complexity of the ontology. Um, there's also lots of different gene ontology resources that are freely available, um, and you can, you can find these online. Um, one of them that I recommend if you're interested in the gene ontology is QuickGo. Um, it just basically is a search engine for Go, and it's pretty fast and easy to use, so um, you can just browse ontology using that. Um, there are also, just as a message, there's lots of other ontologies, but gene ontology is pretty much the only one that we typically see because it's the most popular, widely used, most comprehensive one, although depending on what your task is, you should know that there are other ones. Okay, so gene ontology is a major source of biological pathway information, in particular the biological process part of it. So just again, that's the part that I recommend focusing on. And actually when we do pathway analysis, I recommend starting with um, pathways that are, you know, uh, annotated, uh, curated by people. So um, eliminate the, the uh, so I, work, I, I recommend focusing on pathways, for instance, like biological process and also the pathways that we'll talk about in these databases, and also removing the IEA uh, evidence codes from, from gene ontology. That's the, the lower quality annotation. Except, as I mentioned, if you just don't have any high quality annotation for those species that you're working with. Um, okay, so now on to pathway databases. So pathway databases are another source of pathway information. Um, there are actually hundreds of them. We put a, w a website together that just lists a bunch. Um, it's called pathguide.org. Um, there's also pathway, uh, there's also um, some pathway analysis tools like the very popular GSEA or gene set enrichment analysis tool maintains their own database of pathways. It's called MSIGDB, which originally is stood, you know, was focused on collecting signatures, so it's called Molecular Signature Database. But actually, increasingly, they're focusing on keeping track of pathways. And then Pathway Commons is a website that I'm involved in, in developing that tries to collect major databases together to be, kind of be a one-stop shop. Um, so that's just a potential interest. There are also lots of other types of annotations, as I briefly mentioned, um, like, you know, disease association and drug targets and, you know, different protein properties, like whether a protein has a particular domain, like it's a protein kinase. Um, and these you can get from gene, uh, uh, gene genome browsers, uh, like Ensemble, um, or model organism databases. And if you're interested in these, you can ask about them during the lab uh, or during, during uh, lab sessions. Um, just to highlight one of them, um, how many people have heard of Ensemble? Ensemble is a reasonably popular genome browser. UCSC is, an, is another popular one. So UCSC is the most popular one for, for human. Um, Ensemble uh, provides a lot of different organisms and also provides more services that, uh, that you can kind of search, like this Biomart service. Um, so Biomart is a kind of like a shopping mall for gene annotation. So you can say, um, and I'll just 
cover this very briefly. You can, if you use it, it's, I, I include this here because it's difficult to understand how to use it when you just go there. It's very non-intuitive to start. Once you start, and when, and once you understand the basic thing, then it's very easy to use. Um, but the, the basic thing is that you have to select, um, you know, the type of information you're thinking about, like genes, and then you have to select the genome, and you have to kind of wait, and then it updates, and then it will say, okay, I recognize that you're talking about human. Um, now what you do is you, um, you can uh, do two things after that. One, you filter the genome down in some way. Like you can say, I only want genes that are protein kinases, and you can give it a gene ontology term for that. Or I only want genes on chromosome 1, or I only want uh, genes that are close to this other gene. Um, and so you create these filters. And then each time you create a filter, you can kind of click this little, a little button that says count and it will tell you how many genes you have match that filter. And then once you do that, you can download information and you can download gene ontology terms, you can download whole sequences, so you can make a sequence database, you can download structures, you can download gene, gene identifiers. Um, so this is a way you can kind of download a bunch of information in a spreadsheet about genes of interest. So it's quite powerful. So I just cover it briefly here. Um, okay, so um, let's see, how are we doing for time? Okay, we started a bit early, so I think we're going to end a bit early as well. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I'm basically mostly done, but we're going to, um, I'm just going to summarize what we've learned. So, uh, and then we can talk, we can maybe spend more time asking questions in, in general, just any kind of question. Because I think uh, I think we're supposed to end it officially on the schedule. We're supposed to end at eleven this morning. Yeah, so we'll end a bit earlier, like 20, 15, 20 minutes early. Um, okay, so um, so we've learned that pathway information uh, is available from many different sources, and uh, sometimes accessing all of these sources can be daunting. Uh, so we'll talk about during this course the rec kind of recommendations. Um, one of the things that we maintain in our lab is a um, like a gene set database that we use regularly, and we basically wrote a script to collect the information from many different databases and filter it in the way that we like. And but it's only available for human and mouse and maybe rat, um, and that's just because we happen to work on those organisms. But um, uh, at least we provide all the documentation and you can sort of see what's there. And so later we'll talk about that and that's sort of an easy, to pl easy, to, easy place to go access geneless data from for certain types of analysis. Um, otherwise, gene ontology biological process is usually the starting point for most people. Um, and uh, it varies widely depending on the organism that you're studying. Um, so human is the most well annotated for uh, pathway databases, like databases like Reactome, which we'll hear about tomorrow, focus on collecting pathway information for human. And for some reason, most pathway databases historically have just really focused on human. Um, however, gene ontology historically came out of the model of organism databases. So if you study yeast, for instance, gene ontology annotations for yeast are the best of any organism because the yeast database was one of the creators of the gene ontology, and they actually have collected, have, have gone through every paper that has ever been published for yeast, and, um, and they've, they've annotated every gene against that, so it's completely comprehensive. A lot of the genes are still unknown, but they actually say we, you know, it's unknown, and we verify that it's unknown because we couldn't find any papers about it, um, and they keep that up to date. Now, that's easier for yeast because there are only tens of thousands of papers in yeast, for human, that's much more difficult because there are millions of papers for 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 human, and um, um, uh, and so people there's a lot of literature, a lot of information that's still s present in the literature only and won't be in the pathway databases. So I guess that's one interesting thing that we can discuss is that um, if you are doing pathway enrichment analysis and the information that you want is not there, you can actually change the pathway databases. You can create your own gene set um, whenever you want, and you can also add genes or, or remove genes from a gene set. And the, the gene set databases are text files that you can edit in a text editor, and so they're actually fairly easy files to look at and edit. 
Um, the only issue with them is they could be big. So uh, that, that could be a challenge to kind of work with them if you're not used to working with very big text files. But they are just a, a, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is they are editable. You can create your own. And sometimes that ends up being very valuable. Certain analyses that we've done have de depended on um, you know, someone coming in and saying, well, gene ontology or any pathway database doesn't cover the biology of interest for me. So I'm going to make three gene sets that are like really important and then I'm going to incorporate that into the database and you know sometimes those come out as enriched as well. You can also do um, you know one gene set against your database. You don't have to against your gene list. You don't have to um, you don't have to do what we so this whole course will focus on taking a gene list and searching a bunch of pathways like thousands of them. Um, you could also just take one pathway uh, or gene set which could be like a uh, gene signature or something, doesn't have to be a pathway, and compare it to your gene list. And that asks, uh, that is, asks a, a slightly different question, that, which is, you know, does my gene list match some known gene list? Um, okay, so, um, you know, if you have questions uh, about specific databases that might be available for your area of interest, you can ask myself or Veronique or others uh, in the class uh, who are teaching the class um, and we might be able to recommend some but sometimes you'll find that uh, that there just aren't and sometimes we work with people okay I work with a researcher who studies um, um, like a uh, um, a stem cell model organism that I'm forgetting the Latin name of um, I always forget the Latin name of but it's basically this little uh, flu this little uh, flatworm that uh, regenerates. What's what's the planaria? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so he studies planaria, and um, and there are no gene ontology annotations for planaria. So basically, he he mapped them via orthology from another organism. Sometimes he he used mouse, um, even though mouse is far away from other organisms. Like you might think that there's C. elegans is a is a uh, a worm, and planaria is a you know kind of worm. So you might take the information from, 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 uh, from worm. However, we found that mouse had better gene an ontology annotation, and a lot of the genes are conserved, especially in stem cell-related processes that he was interested in. So, um, so he took that data from mouse, and the way he took that data is he mapped the information using orthology. So you can, um, it's a little bit more advanced. There's not an easy tool out there that uh, always that does this for you that I'm aware of. Um, so sometimes it requires some scripting, but, uh, but it's relatively straightforward. You can download a data, you can download a list of orthology relationships from Ensemble is one place that makes those available. And probably the organism you're studying is present in Ensemble somehow, um, or you can find those somewhere else. And the worst comes to worst, you have to compute them yourself. Uh, which is also possible, but then starting to get more advanced. Um, and then you can convert uh, the uh, genes, basically, from one organism to another by orthology. Has anyone done that? Um, one person? Okay, so, um, yeah? Also, uh, Biomer has a tool to do that. Oh, they do have a tool to do that? I don't that? know how many species it covers, but uh, it's their favorite thing to do, Okay. You you uh, you type in genes in 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 Biomart in the thing that I mentioned. Yeah, you put in all the gene IDs and then you click like your uh, the organism that you're using. You want to find like, humans or something? You just click human. Oh, wait, when you when you ask for annotations, you can say, "Give me the human orthologs." Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, any general questions about pathway data, where it comes from, problems with it? Okay. Um, okay, so back to this workflow, just to summarize uh, once more, um, you know, uh, this is the, the sort of standard workflow. Um, we want to learn about underlying cellular mechanism uh, using pathway analysis, um, visualizing, identifying the pathways to identify interesting pathways, and then drilling down once we find something interesting to a specific model. Um, it's not the only thing you can do with pathway analysis. Um, here, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give, I guess because we have some additional time, I'll give some additional examples and just see if the, um, the last slide that I have is kind of a lab that you can do yourself if you're interested in working with gene identifiers. So um, you can, uh, it just gives you some pointers to, to try and do that yourself if you have a gene list yourself. So I just recommend 
playing with those tools just to, to learn them a little bit. We're not covering them in, in any labs. Um, so one other, uh, um, one other uh, thing that you can do with pathway analysis, so I, I should mention, I actually should emphasize this more in the introduction, that oftentimes pathway analysis gives you a hypothesis. So it's hypothesis generating. Um, frequently it doesn't give you the actual answer that you publish. Um, if you just publish the pathway analysis without doing anything else, um, oftentimes it's just like publishing a bunch of hypotheses uh, and then someone else is going to have to follow up on those hypotheses. Um, so it's important to know that pathway analysis is often a, f uh, a first step. Um, wherever you want to generate hypotheses, it's very valuable uh, for any kind of exploratory analysis. Um, uh, but then, obviously, the, the, you'll, you'll get more understanding of the system if you actually take those hy hypotheses and follow them up with additional experiments. Um, there are... Um, when, when, uh, when we work with people who... Uh, when we show the people that we work with pathway analysis results, I often, found that there's, I often find that there's different... Uh, ways people kind of react to the pathways. Um, sometimes they say, oh, too many pathways, but you know, we have ways of, that we'll talk to you about today about how to filter and, and identify interesting ones and how to manage the results. Um, but also in defining what's interesting, sometimes people say, oh, the top of the, th the, top of the list, the most significant pathways, those are by default the, the most interesting. Um, and if it's a novel pathway at the top, that's very significant. You should probably try to follow up on that. Sometimes people say, oh, I can't really follow up on that because it's, it's in an area of biology that I can't easily access with experiments that I know about. Um, like sometimes strange metabolic pathways come up and then you have to have specialized biochemistry skills to analyze those pathways. Um, if you really, um, I actually encourage people to like try to think about how they can follow up on those because um, otherwise you kind of keep yourself in a little area of known, you know, of knowledge that is not branching out. Um, and but it, but you know, it's not. I don't want to be too harsh because you know, frequently there's lots of interesting hypotheses that come out, and you can take different paths. And sometimes people select the path that's going to be the easiest path. Just be aware that there's a little bit of a trade-off there with easiest path versus the most impactful path in terms of scientific discovery. Um, the other, uh, there, there are ways that you can use pathway analysis as the kind of result. It's not in, in, in the end hypothesis generating. So one way that we've found uh, it's quite useful is if, you, if you're comparing two different or two or more different uh, conditions, like in our research it frequently, we frequently uh, have to do this with um, like cancer subtypes. So this ependymoma example that I mentioned when the gene expression analysis was originally collect collected and clustering identified two different types, type A and type B. Um, you know, clearly the, they were differentially, they had a lot of genes that were differentially expressed between these two types. But to strengthen the, but there wasn't really, after that, you know, there wasn't really much else that you can say in terms of how different they were. So doing a pathway analysis on each one separately and showing that there are very different pathways that are active in those two subtypes suggested or added support for the statement that they're biologically different. And so that in, in that way, we could actually take the pathway analysis results and publish it as a result. And, it, and it's, it, it, it is hypothesis generating because it generated a bunch of hypotheses for pathways to study, but at the same time, um, the actual pathway analysis was just publishable to support a statement in a paper. Um, okay, so that's that's uh, just a, a, some additional insight. Any any questions in general about pathway analysis or other things that people want to mention? Um, using uh, gene editing to predict uh, GO analysis, gene ontology analysis, is it possible to merge the molecular functions and biological process in the same? Yeah. So the question. Yeah. So the question is. It, can you merge different aspects of gene ontology together? And yes, you can. It's very easy to do that. Um, most analysis tools will just allow you to select them uh, or deselect them. My recommendation, just to clarify, is to start with biological process because it um, uh, it just um, gives you the most value in the results. And then if it's not giving you value or you know it's not what you want to do, you can easily just select the other boxes and include molecular function or cellular component. Um, it's very easy to add those or, or subtract them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And just a note with geo, so uh, 
is a bit confusing. People say Go or Geo, which is understandable, but also people might know there's a Geo database that's GEO, Gene Expression Omnibus. So sometimes people um, say Geo and they're talking about Go analysis, but they, the other person thinks they're talking about Gene Expression Omnibus, which is where all the gene expression data is stored and you have to submit it when you publish a paper. Um, people might know that, but it's um, uh, a point that comes up sometimes of confusion. Any other questions? So thanks for reminding me about that. <laughs> I have another yeah. one. Is it possible for a biological process and also in GO to see if it's an inhibitor or activator or the pathway biological process or not? So the question is, um, can you learn about inhibition and, and uh, activation from this type of analysis? The answer is sometimes you can if the pathway is annotated. Um, as the inhibitory part of the pathway and the activation part of the pathway. And gene ontology does have a lot of terms about inhibition of pathways and activation of pathways. And increasingly, they're at, those terms are linked to genes and they're annotated. But it's not as widely annotated as the main biological processes. So frequently, you don't see that information. Um, but it is possible to see it. And over time, it will get better. Um, so that's one, of the, that's one of the things that you, that I, that sort of usually happens in this mechanistic drill down. So, um, so yeah, so the theoretically and, and, you know, it is possible, but in practice, usually, um, we think about that when we're, after we've identified a pathway and then you look at the genes in the pathway that are actually responsible for the enrichment. And in GSEA, there's a specific name for those, which we'll cover later, which is the leading edge genes. And those genes are like the genes that contribute the most to the fact that the pathway is enriched. And if you look at those on the pathway, you might find that they're all inhibitors of the pathway. So then that's pretty important to know because you thought the pathway was active, but it's actually the inhibitors of the pathway that are active. And so, yeah, it's good to know that. Yeah. Um, I had a question regarding protein-protein interactions. Um, mm -hmm. Say when you use pathway analysis, you were referring to uh, your first study where uh, you had uh, different mutated genes in different individual patients, um, but then you were able to find that there were certain pathways that were clearly uh, significant. Um, is it similarly possible, like in, uh, that in the gene list, there's uh, say a gene that's a protein-protein interactor uh, and should be accounted for as belonging to a specific pathway? And is it possible to do that uh, with the uh, pathway analysis software uh, that? So the question is, can you consider protein interactions um, when you, uh, you are doing this type of analysis that I've focused on today? Um, in general, the gene list information does not incorporate, um, uh, so um, there are a few answers to this question. So one, protein interactions are considered in gene function annotation, like gene ontology um, will annotate a gene to be part of a process if there's a protein interaction. And there's even a specific evidence code for that called IPI, inferred from protein interaction. Um, and there's other ones that are similar, like different types of interactions. Um, so some of those are, are incorporated, but those are generally the well-known ones. There's a vast database, you know, vast amount of information of um, protein interactions and other types of interactions, which we'll cover mostly tomorrow. Um, um, I call them generally like the general notion is functional interaction, like any kind of interaction between genes that um, could be of different types, like protein interaction, genetic interaction, co-expression, um, you know, things like that that are uh, similar protein domains that allow you to kind of know that that one gene is maybe functioning, that those two genes might be functioning similarly. Um, so that concept we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about tomorrow. But in general, that information is not considered in the standard gene set-based pathway enrichment analysis that we focus on today. Um, it is possible to consider it. Like, you could create your own gene sets that are the set of genes that interacts with another gene, and you can use that. People don't do that too frequently. It kind of sometimes generates too many gene lists. Um, the better way of uh, um, doing it, so you could you know, sort of do that in this mechanistic drill down um, section here. Um, where's my pointer? Um, here. But actually, the better way of dealing with it is usually in this network analysis type of um, thing that we'll start focusing on tomorrow. Um, so one of the things that we do tomorrow is 
uh, this Reactome Functional Interaction Network Analysis that allows you to download a very uh, comprehensive network, at least for human, um, that includes lots of protein interactions, and you can also include your own ones. Um, and then uh, if you take mutations, it will identify regions of the network that are highly mutated and connected. Um, and so that is a different kind of approach. So, um, so the quick answer is not really. Networks are not really considered too much in the gene set world. Um, except they're, except where they're like integrated into the gene set annotation, um, and most people use different tools to, to, to handle rich network information. Sorry, just yep. one additional question. Is, uh, is there tissue-specific data in these uh, software tools? The, so the question, it's a very important question, uh, is there tissue-specific data in, in the software tools? Generally not. Generally all of the data, um, I should definitely mention this in the in the slides, but generally all the data that we um, use in pathway enrichment analysis and even in the network enrichment analysis <laughs> is what I call context free. So it's it's the you can consider it as the um, the set of things that could happen at any given time in an organism overall developmental stages. Um, and does not specify what happens at an individual tissue or an individual developmental stage. Um, the way you, there is a lot of information about that. And the reason why that's the case is that there's a, even though there's a lot of information about, a lot of knowledge about, you know, which gene is expressed in which tissue in the literature, it's far from comprehensive. So even if you took the time to um, extract that information from the literature, and already that would be a huge amount of work, um, what you left with, what you'd be left with is a patchwork of information where most genes you know, don't have any information about it because they haven't been studied in that particular context. And there's thousands or infinite number of contexts, so it's not really scalable to specify them all. So what people do to approach that is you actually use the genomics data to help you define what's active in a particular tissue. So if you have, if you're studying brain um, or liver, then you can, um, you can, uh, and you have gene expression data or protein expression data, that's actually the best definition of what's expressed in the tissue. Um, that's going to change a little bit as studies come out that make, and, and, and there are some reference maps that, um, like the big one is GTEx, um, people might have heard of, that's G-T-E-X. That's a, uh, for anyone who's interested in tissue specific expression, at least for human, they take normal human tissues and they do a lot of RNA-seq on them, like thousands of RNA-seq experiments, and they're trying to make a catalog like an, uh, an atlas of tissue, tissue specific expression for all human genes. Um, and then now these days there's a new project uh, called the Human Cell Atlas which seeks to use single cell RNA-seq to do the same thing to, gener to identify all uh, single cell, all cell types in the body at all developmental stages um, and um, and get an RNA-seq profile for every cell type. And we don't know how many cell types there are. There could be tens of thousands or millions. Or, um, but the technology now allows you to, single-cell RNA-seq technology and other types of single-cell um, omics technologies allow you to um, actually do that at the single-cell level and get like a very detailed profile per tissue. Like, um, actually, and I'm talking, you know, people in Toronto are doing that for liver, actually. Interested. Um, so, um, actually, we don't cover single cell technologies here, but my lab happens to do a lot of work in that area, so you're welcome to ask questions about it. Uh, I just have a question about the methods to map our uh, gene base of interest onto uh, gene ontology database or other pathway database. So, um, so what do you go like? Do you go from the best? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Because I didn't quite yeah, understand my, the middle part. My, my question is just basically how do you, how do, you do the mapping uh, for our gene list onto gene ontology data? Okay. Or okay. Data? Sorry. Uh, so the question is how do you map gene ontology terms to your gene list? Uh, the answer is uh, it's 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 actually. Um, I should have made this clear, but it's uh, it's the mapping's already done for you, and you just look it up in a database. So when you you don't actually have to do that step; it's all automated as part of these analysis tools. So when you so typically these analysis tools, and I actually should 
should give a mental note to myself. I should give an example of actually running through one of these pathway analysis, but we'll see, see it soon. Um, you, you just give it your gene list, and it does everything for you. So the, um, the gene ontology is ma uh, mapping is done by the curators who make these association files, and then um, they consider information like protein domains and things like that. And then um, your gene is already there with its gene ontology annotations, and so it's a database. Does that make sense? Okay. So my gene list is not there. So um, that's why I don't think um, the gene IDs that I have are available in the data. Okay. So I should go for let's say the best blast hit or the uh, the, the yeah the oh best blast hit. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So um um yeah. So if you don't if you want to kind of map your own gene ontology terms, the best thing to do is via orthology mapping. And what you said, I just that was the point that I didn't that I missed. Best blast hit is a good way of doing that, but there's actually better ways of defining orthology, and so um, it's good to use the advanced orthology methods. Um, best blast hit is uh, can give you some issues because sometimes there's gene expansion, and the functions of those genes are very different, and blast will not filter that. But the orthology mapping tools, which have a couple of additional rules on top of blast searching, will help you result uh, refine that and for instance, give you like a one-to-one -one orthology versus a one-to-many orthology, and it will also identify paralogs. And so when you get into that level, there's actually tools that help you define orthologs in a more evolutionarily correct, uh, evolutionary, correct based on evolutionary theory way, and that's useful for gene function prediction because people, when, when, gene, when genes duplicate, they usually diverge in function, and so you don't always want to use sequence. Um, sometimes the function is known to have diverged quite far, even for sequences that might be similar. So these orthology mapping systems um, are the best to use. Uh, and usually they're pre-computed, but if you if you want to compute them, you use a tool, and some like one of them is called InParanoid, um, and another one's called OrthoMCL, and these are software packages that you can use to compute those yourself. Um, that's a time-consuming compute operation, requires a powerful computer usually, or a, like it might take a few days. Um, and uh, so that's why it's good to use pre-computed ones if you can find it. And then um, the, uh, uh, and then if that doesn't work, you can do your own gene ontology gene function prediction, um, but that's a much more in-depth type of thing that requires more bioinformatics um, software to come together in a pipeline. That's a, bet, a good question to ask, again, after tomorrow when we talk about gene mania, because gene mania covers gene function prediction, and it can actually be applied broadly, and the exact way that it, it works will be covered tomorrow, and so think about that question again. Mm -hmm.